Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of To The Point Podcast. Hope you guys all had a good weekend. Uh, obviously, this weekend we had the Super Bowl. Um, hopefully, there wasn't too many parties because I'm hoping we go back into Orange today or sometime this week. Um, so if you guys did have a party, um, I'm not a big fan of you right now. But nevertheless, I hope you guys all enjoyed Super Bowl weekend. Um, I know I did last night. It wasn't exactly the game I was expecting, um, but I picked the Bucks to win. The Bucks won. So when it comes to game picks, I'm happy with that. Uh, you know, just to boost myself a little bit, I went 11 and two in, uh, in picks over the playoffs. So, you know, if you wanted to hit pro line, you could have listened to it to the point and you could have made some good money. Um, but uh, it was, you know, a lot of stuff happening over the weekend. I was, the Super Bowl obviously takes up a lot of the air, but yesterday afternoon, some great action in golf. Uh, you know, the waste management open. We saw Brooks Kepka, I mean, make an incredible chip for Eagle on 17, which really sealed the uh, tournament for him, beating Xander Shoffley and Kei Hung Lee by one stroke. Um, you know, the Toronto Maple Leafs been playing some great hockey, which I'll touch on in this podcast. Uh, the Australian Open kicked off last night with uh, some Canadian content. Rebecca Marino, uh, uh, Bianca Andreescu returning with a victory. Uh, Milos Raonic winning in straight sets. Uh, Novak Djokovic winning last night. So um, I'm also going to touch on in this podcast, the NBA All-Star Game. Um, if you know me a little bit, you know I hate the shootout and I hate All-Star Games. Uh and I'll have my opinion about what the NBA is doing later on the show. And uh, just a little tease, it, it's not going to be a positive take uh, on what Adam Silver and the NBA are trying to accomplish here during a pandemic. And, you know, you, who's who's not clamoring for an all-star game? But, yeah, uh, but of course, we're going to start with the Super Bowl. It was the last day of, of the 2020-2021 uh, NFL season, and it – I think the game, was it the best Super Bowl I've ever watched? No. Um, but I heard people a few years ago when the Patriots beat the Rams, people thought that was a boring game. I disagree completely. I like defense. Defense wins championships. I grew up on that motto. And, you know, in that year, Julian Edelman won the MVP. You could argue Dante Hightower should have won it. Tom Brady, I'm shocked. That he didn't win it because they give it to the quarterback every time, which is asinine. But I enjoyed that game. We saw Aaron Donald. We saw Hightower. We saw great defensive players that don't get a lot of pla- a huge platform show out. And I think we saw something similar last night. Obviously, the Bucks just mauled the Kansas City Chiefs. 31-9 victory. Um, an effective game. Tom Brady played as good as he could play, in my opinion. I think he played fantastic last night especially in the first half. Um, but the big story for me, and if I look, I think of headlines and, you know, obviously there's a Super Bowl. The big headline of course is Tom Brady wins fifth MVP trophy, seventh Super Bowl. He's the greatest of all time. I- I've pushed back on that forever. I'm not going to now. He's got more championships than, you know, Michael Jordan, who I think, you know, a lot of people my age or younger will say, well, LeBron James is the best NBA player to ever play. I don't think so. Um, but, you know, Brady, seven, seven titles speaks for itself. He's 43 years old. He's an incredible, he's a freak. I mean, that's the best way to, to describe him. He's a freak. Nobody wants to take those hits. Nobody wants to do this for that period of time. Do I think he's the most talented quarterback ever? Hell no. No, I don't even think he's in the top 20. And you just think of this. Think of Dan Marino. Think of Patrick Mahomes. John Elway. They, they had better arms than Tom Brady, but he... He's got that winning mantra, that that winning mentality that these other quarterbacks just didn't have. Terry Bradshaw, Joe Montana were good winners, but you know, they won three, four Super Bowls. Tom has won seven with five MVPs. So credit to him. But when I think of the headline, and I think of, you know, not the media headline, the to the point headline, which is the one I care about, it's the Bucks defense. And I could point to so many people today, and I'm just going to bounce around. Devin White. It's a middle linebacker. He's number 45. You would have saw him all night last night. He flashed. When you think of players, just think, did, do I notice them? Did I notice them last night? If you didn't notice Devin White, you weren't watching the game. He was flying across the field. He did a lot of stuff last night that actually hindered Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill would be running to slants. Devin White would just bounce into him. 
and it's not pass interference. It's not holding because it's within five yards. You break up the route, makes it hard for Tyree Kill to get down the field, and Patrick Mahomes had no time to throw the ball. Devin White was also tackling Kelsey the whole night. He limited big plays to Miko. He made a huge tackle on Miko Hardman where it looked like he was going to get a screen pass, break it off. He gets no gain on uh, second and eight. It's, I think Devin White was huge last night. Another guy who I predicted to win the MVP, and I think he could have last night, Shaq Barrett. He got a sack. Did he play? Did he have two and a half sacks and a strip sack? No, but he did what he, I mean, the whole game, Patrick Mahomes was on his heels. And, you know, I, there was this kind of this narrative before the game. He, I, you know, Adam Schefter reported that Patrick Mahomes has this foot problem, might have to have surgery, which could be probably is true. But the injury excuse is not happening on this podcast today. Kansas City did not lose that game because Patrick Mahomes had a hurt foot. No, no. If you're on the field, you're playing and you get judged accordingly. If you're hurt, Sit on the bench. That's how I look. I, I've heard you know, Shannon Sharps, an athlete who's won three Super Bowls. I heard him say that. You're on the field. You're accountable. So Shaq Barrett, JPP, Jason Pierre-Paul, they were beating Remmers and Allegrati on the edges the whole night. And Mahomes, I countless third downs where they just beat them right off the hop. And he had to run for his life. He got sacked a couple times. He was getting hit. And he had no time to make plays. And really, the whole game, if you think about it, the only time Mahomes had time to make throws was to Kelsey in the middle. And he really only got that later in the game. It started in the the last drive of of the first half. He started finding Kelsey middle of the field. He dumped the ball off to him, pick up some yardage. Tyree Kill was a non factor in this game. Another big reason for that Sean Murphy bunting. He's a guy, I think. I think the MVP should have went to the Bucks defense collectively. And I know that, that might sound wrong, but it's actually happened before. Back in Super Bowl 13, the Oakland Raiders uh, offensive line won the MVP award as a collective group. They won it as a group because they controlled the line of scrimmage. And that won them the game. It wasn't quarterback play. It wasn't the running. They gave it to the offensive line. So this is not unheard of. And, but Murphy Bunting was on Tyree Kill most of the game. Carlton Davis was on him early. Carlton Davis was not the answer. Murphy Bunting played the best game of his career. He locked up Hill. He made some big plays down the field on Kelsey, broke up a few passes. I thought he was fantastic. Um, He easily could have won the MVP himself because did he get a pick? No, but he did everything but. Um, Another guy who flashed me, Antoine Winfield Jr. out of Minnesota. Guy's a rookie, gets an interception in the Super Bowl, breaks up a pass that was intended for Kelsey. It's at the end of the first first half. It's a third down pass from Mahomes to Kelsey. It's in Kelsey's hands. He swats it away. Huge play. Um, and it it was just a dominant performance. And those are just some of the guys. I think Vita Vea had a really good game. You know, in Dominic. The whole team flashed on defense. The Chiefs, just to put this into perspective, over the past two seasons, the Chiefs have led the NFL in total offense the past two years. With those combined yards, it's the most yardage in a two-year span in the history of the NFL. The history of the NFL, okay? A lot of years. A lot of you know, Tom Brady, you know, Joe Montana, Dan Marino offenses. History of the NFL. This Tampa Bay defense held the same offense to nine points last night. Nine points. Mahomes did not throw a touchdown. One interception was not even close to his normal self. And to be honest, if Mitchell Schwartz, if Eric Fisher were in the game, would have made a difference. Yeah. But I still don't think Kansas City wins this game. The defensive backs, the the corners had them locked up. Tyreek Hill couldn't do anything last night. Nicole Hardman, non-factor. Kelsey was the only guy, but like I said, it was because he was in the middle of the field and they gave them that after a while. And a lot of that was in garbage time too. The game was over. I felt like tweeting, you know, 
that's all folks, you know, the Bugs Bunny slogan, because it was over at halftime. It was over. The game was over. And it, it was just adopt the defense for, for uh, Tampa Bay was just unbelievable last night. And um, pivoting to Brady. Obviously this is huge. He wins six Super Bowls in New England with, you know, the genius Bill Belichick. But this win, for me, elevates him above Bill. He wins his seventh championship, and but he does it without Belichick. He does it with Bruce Arians. He does it in Tampa Bay, his first year with a new team during a pandemic where he didn't have time to work with receivers before the season. And, you know, he his playoffs, this is not his best playoffs uh, against Green Bay. In the first half, he might have played his best half ever. Second half, he was terrible. He threw three picks, yet they won the game. Last night, I thought his first half was he, – he had a game manager, and that's not a slight. When people say you're a game-managing quarterback, I think people take that as a, as a knock. It isn't. It means you're, you're efficient. Tom Brady, uh, that's his mantra. Just be efficient. Don't turn the ball over. And he was efficient last night. He – you know, through two touchdown passes to Gronk, you know, Gronk had a huge game. I'll, I'll admit I was wrong about that. Me and Ryder talked about it on Friday where I didn't think he'd have over four and a half catches. You know, he had seven last night, two touchdowns, big game. You know, he was retired last year too, comes back because Brady told him to come to Tampa. We can win. Well, guess what? They did. And, but through two touchdowns to Gronk, one to Antonio Brown, the two, you know, he threw his touchdown passes to guys that, have had trouble, you know, AB most troubled past ever, but he wins the ring with, with Brady and Tampa Bay. Um, you know, Mike Evans, who's really their best receiver, had one catch last night. One catch. He did draw two pass interferences on Bashad Breeland, who had a really tough night. Uh, he was getting cooked by anybody they wanted to put on him. And, you know, a huge redemption game as well for Leonard Fournette. You know, Leonard Fournette was drafted fourth overall by the Jaguars out of LSU. Had a lot of promise coming in the NFL. Had some consistency, consistency issues. Had some weight issues with Jacksonville. And, you know, he was cut at the beginning of the season. He goes to T Tampa Bay, plays for league minimum. Last night, again, he's a guy that had a rushing touchdown, had over 50 yards receiving, ran the ball really efficiently, 27-yard touchdown rush. He, he was great last night. He did – what Brady needed him to do. They, they, when they gave, gave him the ball, gave him in his belly, he didn't turn the ball over. He ran hard downfield and the chiefs had a hard time bringing him down. And it's, it was, it was a game where for me, just Kansas city couldn't do anything. You know, Kansas city, something they hate to do is run the ball. And they had to run the ball last night. Mahomes. First two, first two possessions, I could tell you how the game was going to go. He had to run the ball four times in his first two possessions, twice for first downs. And, you know, it said before the game, he's got a foot, hit, foot issue. Well, he couldn't find it. He, they were so locked up down the field that he couldn't find anybody. And the Chiefs defense was not good last night. I mean, there was a play where Daniel Sorensen, you know, Brady's got the ball. He does a play action. If you remember, it's the third quarter. He starts backtracking because he thinks it's going to be a big play. He leaves Leonard Fournette in the flat for a first down. I was like, what? That's your guy. Play contain. Take your guy. Don't freak out because you read the play wrong. Cover the tailback. And, you know, the Honey Badger, who's no, he's an all-pro. He's a great player. Him and Brady got into it early. And the, they called a pass interference on him in the end zone at the end of the first half. I don't think that was a penalty with 10 seconds left. But, you know, a lot of people get on the officials because they say they help Brady. And I think there's truth to that, but not last night. I think every call that was a call last night. Uh, again, the Brady haters, last night Brady did not win because of officiating. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers won because they were the better football team, period. Um, and, you know... It, what a, you know, what a year where you get COVID postpone, you know, cancel postpone games and playing games on Friday and Wednesday afternoon. And for Tampa Bay to 
play in a home Super Bowl, win it, and to battle through and get the victory, I think it's so impressive on them. And, you know, it's it, it's just an impressive thing to see here uh, where it – you got the Tampa Bay Lightning winning the Stanley Cup in Tampa Bay. You got the Buccaneers winning. It, it, it could be something special here because Brady, yeah, he's 43 years old. On paper, he should be done. He's coming back next year. And why wouldn't they be the favorite in the NFC? I think the Rams are close. You know, you could say Green Bay, but if people are betting against Tom Brady, you're an idiot. He's been proving you wrong for decades. And they're still going to have the same team. Most of that, that team is going to be back. And and I felt anything can happen, but I'm just saying, who knows? I wouldn't bet against Brady because a lot of people have bet against Brady and they lost money doing it. Or some of their pride when, you know, you just pick against them because you don't like the guy. I think you got to appreciate greatness. And you know, maybe Michael Jordan wasn't your cup of tea, but you, if you watch The Last Dance, you can appreciate how good he was at his sport, how hard he worked at it. Tom, if you look at the picture of his combine, he looks like a guy who's played chess five minutes before. He had the worst, he ran the worst 40 in the history of the combine. People still say that, but he worked at it. He's really, his nutrition is off the, you know, he's drinking his avocado smoothie, whatever the hell it is. He's doing it the right way. And you got to give a ton of credit to him for just persevering, for winning, and being the best team sport winner since Bill Russell. Um, you know, obviously that was a long time ago, but he's got more rings than Jordan. He's got more rings, more rings than Messier. He's got, you know, he's got seven championships. That'll never be that'll never be rectified. That'll never, he'll never get past in titles. In my, it would be crazy if he is, but in appearances and titles, I don't think this record will ever be broken. Now to Mahomes. Rough night for him, like I mentioned. He really didn't have anybody to throw to, but even when he did, he was, he was off. In the first half, he had open receivers. First drive, he had Hardman twice. Wide open, missed them both. I think he started the game nervous. He was flustered because the pass rush was in his face. But, you know, for everybody who said, oh, Mahomes, you know, he's this wonder king, he can't be beaten. Well, the Chiefs, the Chiefs just got their ass kicked last night, and that includes Mahomes. He was outplayed by the opposing quarterback and Tom Brady. It's just a fact. Um, and for him, you know, there was this narrative before the game, which I think was a lazy, you know, media narrative. It was like a, it was like a lease narrative how stupid this one was for me. That, you know, if he won the Super Bowl while well, he was still in it with Brady. And if he won last night, okay, Chiefs win last night. They, they went two Super Bowls in a row, which is impressive. But he would only have two. Brady would still have six. Who says he's going to win four more? I mean, Brady did not win a Super Bowl from age 28 to 36. It's eight years without winning one. You're telling me Mahomes and the Chiefs are just going to run off Super Bowl after Super Bowl? Now, the Bills went to four in a row. They lost all four of them. Mahomes could get to Super Bowls. Maybe he loses every everyone he's in. He should have lost against San Fran if Jimmy Garoppolo doesn't melt down in the fourth quarter. It's He's a great player, but to crown a guy with only two rings, it's just ridiculous to me. Is he a great player? Yes, he's, he's a Hall of Famer right now. He's been to two Super Bowls, won, won, won an MVP, won a Super Bowl MVP. That's, that's all fine and good. But Mahomes, it's not fair to him because he's not the one saying this. It's the media who need something to talk about. They bring this up. Well, I mean, that narrative's put the – it was dead before. It's fucking dead now. Um, and – The GOAT debate, it's such a subjective thing. And I don't, look, I'll say this. I think Brady's the best, obviously he's the best quarterback ever. He's won seven titles. Do I think Tom Brady's the best football player ever? No, I don't. Because 
when I think of football players, I think of versatility. I think I want a guy who's dynamic. Tom Brady is the least dynamic quarterback ever. He can't move. He's like Phillip Rivers. I think Jim Brown's a better football player than Tom Brady. I think Lawrence Taylor's a better football player than Tom Brady. But when it comes to quarterback, he's obviously the GOAT. But, you know, this whole GOAT thing, it's, it's up, you know, fans can have their opinion on it. And that, that, that's good. You know, it's good to have conversation. For me, it's just, that's not something that really intrigues me all that much. But, you know, the, the Super Bowl, you know, I know a couple people text me, what a boring game. And again, in my power rankings, it would not be that high. Yeah, the, probably the best Super Bowl I've watched in my life. If I had to really, th- I think the 07 one against the Giants was a really good game. That was another low scoring game. So I, that's kind of a theme for me. Um, you know, last year's wasn't bad with, with San Fran and the Chiefs. Um, you know, that game with the Ravens and, and Niners uh, with the whole power going out. I thought that was an interesting game. Um, Seattle and New England was a good game. Good Super Bowl. The Malcolm Butler play. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's last night wasn't in my top 10 for sure, but I think you, you got to appreciate it. It's a sport. It's the, it's a pinnacle of sports. You see yesterday, there's no, this is how big the NFL is. And this is how, this is how, you know, you talk NHL, NBA, they are such little, little factors in what the NFL does. They schedule games all afternoon right before kickoff, and they had nothing during kickoff of the Super Bowl. You know why? Because nobody was going to fucking watch it. And if the, if the NFL was playing when there's the NHL playoffs, they would not give a shit if it was game seven. They'd schedule a game at the same time and say, let's go. Let's see who's watching this game. Because the NFL dominates. They go through a pandemic year, and they kill it. The product was unbelievable this year. You know, my dad, who likes football, but he's on his computer a lot and, you know, not really watching the game. He told me yesterday, what a great season this was. I really enjoyed it. That that tells you everything you need to know. The NFL, I mean, they take a whole day. Sunday, you're not putting in golf early on in the NFL season. They they don't even play hardly because they know nobody's watching the Waste Management Open when the NFL is on because the NFL is a juggernaut and we're small potatoes compared to them. But I got to give, I got to say thank you to the NFL. We're in COVID. I, in last March, there was no sports for almost two months. And it was, it was a dark time for me. I watched Mad Men seven seasons in like two and a half weeks. I know. Um, rewatched the office for the 10th time. You know, I need, this was just, it was Sunday. You knew what you're going to do. You're going to go watch football for like 12 hours. That's, that's so fun to me. To me. That's, and it allowed me to do this podcast and talk about football and, you know, the NFL, I'm not going to stop talking about the NFL because, you know, there's already rumors that Carson Wentz is going to be traded the next few days from Philadelphia to, you know, wh- where, I don't know, maybe the Bears, maybe the Colts. I think the Colts is, is the most ideal landing spot for him. But, you know, the NFL is just, it's a different beast. I love the NHL. I, I love all sports. I you know the UFC, I think is going to be a big in the next couple months. Um, but it's just something about the NFL and, and the effect it has on, on such a large group of people and just football as a whole. You look at the United States, college football, the NFL, it's bigger than Jesus. And, you know, for me, it's certainly bigger than Jesus. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's just, you know, baseball used to be referred to as America's greatest pastime. And, you know, that's, that's been eclipsed by, by football for a long time now. And it just an incredible, incredible sport and, and an incredible year for, for the sport. Um, we'll see where this takes us. Obviously, like I said, we'll have, you know, Kansas city will be back next year. They'll have Kelsey, Tyree kill Mahomes will be back. Hopefully fans can get back in, into the stands. 
Um, but you know, Brady's going to be back too with, with Tampa Bay, you know, he'll be ready to go looking for that eighth title. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what they have to, I think the chiefs should come in next season with a huge chip on their shoulder. Tyree kills a guy who talks a lot. He was kind of waving to Antoine Winfield, his first, first game he played against him. He had 269 yards receiving last night. He had 24. Humble you a little bit. Mahomes didn't throw a touchdown pass. Like I said, threw an interception, looked like Nathan Peterman. It was just an impressive, impressive game. Congratulations to the box, to Tom Brady, but a real big congrats to the real MVP of the game. Like I said, last night, the box defense. If voters had any balls, they would have voted for a defensive player. But as we all know, sometimes you vote for the guy you like. And I'll say, <clears throat> like in 2016 with uh, Phil Kessel and Sidney Crosby. And we remember who should have won the Conn Smythe and who won it. So uh, great, great. It's end of the season. Like I said, it's, it's a happy day. It's also, it's a sad day for me today. Sunday, it'll be rough, you know, no football. I'm, I'm hoping the CFL can, can play this year. I'm, I'm a CFL fan. I know a lot of people don't get into it. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of merit to me and you know, it's been around in Canada for over a hundred years. So I'm hoping we can see more football come June and uh, the CFL will, will be back up and running. But, you know, also Friday before the Super Bowl, we saw some big news where, you know, MLB, you know, it's going to start. They're planning on playing 162. Uh, pitchers and catchers are going to report in about uh, a week to 10 days time. And there was, you know, still a big piece left on the board. Uh, and that pitcher was Trevor Bauer. And Trevor Bauer, he's, he's an interesting guy. He won the NL Cy Young last year with Cincinnati. He's kind of a weird guy. He goes on social media. He does these cryptic tweets. He's, he's not your average guy. He's just, he's a different cat, so to speak. And, you know, the rich keep on getting richer because who goes and signs him? The Los Angeles Dodgers, the reigning uh, World Series champions. And they, they pay him over $40 million. And this contract is an interesting one. It's a three-year deal worth, you know, $102 million. But he has opt-outs after this season and next. So say he goes out this year, pitches fantastic, wins another Cy Young, leads the Dodgers to another, Super, uh, another World Series. He can opt out, go sign a long-term deal somewhere for more money. I know that sounds crazy. Baseball, it happens. You can pay a player whatever you want because you can just pay into the luxury tax. You know, before this signing, the uh, the Dodgers were under the luxury tax number. Now they're over it by like twenty million. They signed him for forty million, but it it's a big move, but it's smart because you go all in. The Dodgers are a team that can win for years, years. They could be a dynasty in baseball, and baseball is the easiest sport to have a dynasty because there's no salary cap you know trevor bauer is making more money this year than the entire cleveland indians roster the, the entire baltimore orioles roster and the entire Pittsburgh pirates roster he's one guy he's making more money than all of them in the whole team that's how crazy it is but if you look at the staff trevor bauer cy young award winner ace of a staff Clayton Kershaw multiple times Cy Young winner maybe not what he used to be still a stud I'd still say he's a fringe ace pitcher Walker Bueller the ace of this staff he's I know a lot of people are Clayton Kershaw defenders Walker Bueller is a better pitcher than Clayton Kershaw right now he he, he hasn't won a Cy Young yet I'll predict him right now he's going to win the NL Cy Young He's too good not to. The guy can throw heat. I mean, he's a loaded. And this the end of their staff. Didn't even pitch last year. They won the World Series. David Price. David Price is Cy Young winner. He's pretty damn good. He's won a World Series in Boston. He was great for them when he was in Boston when they won the World Series. He's their fourth pitcher. He doesn't have to be great. He can be adequate because you have those three guys in front of him. And then he feel, finish off the rotation with Julio Urias, who looks like a pretty damn good pitcher too. 
Not to mention, they got Mookie Betts, who's an MVP, who I think is the best outfielder in baseball. He's got the best arm in baseball, or real close to it. You got Cody Bellinger in center, who's won an MVP, who's won gold gloves. They're, they're loaded, and I still think they'll probably try to sign Justin Turner to return next year at third base. This team is loaded with talent, and they, they're they the favorite to win the World Series again. I don't. If I look in the National League, not a lot of teams have been making splashes. The only other team is their division rival, the San Diego Padres. And, you know, they, they got Blake Snell. They got you, Darvish. They've done some good things. They've added to the rotation. But this signing hurts them because they know to get to the World Series, they need to get through the Dodgers. And with their lineup and their pitching, it's going to be really tough to do it. Really tough. Other than San Diego, there hasn't been many teams that, making, that have been making splashes that have tried to move the needle, so to speak. The Cardinals, you could say, they acquired Nolan Arenado, who probably is the third best third baseman in baseball. But the Cardinals are kind of in this weird spot where they kind of have an older roster. They're trying to make it younger. They don't have a ton of talent. Um, then you, you know, they, right now, Yadier Molina is still a free agent, so they don't know what they'll do at catcher. But it's, for me, I think if the teams that have, you know, I still think the Yankees are a threat. They're in the American League, so they'd meet them in the World Series, but the Yankees always play great and then choke at, at the very end. So I don't have a ton of cough. I think the Blue Jays, uh, the Blue Jays are a good team, but their starting pitching is, they can't get to a World Series with their starting pitching. It's just not good enough. Um, it's not strong enough for them to do it. The Rays are still good, but they lose Blake Snell. They don't have that depth that they had before. They don't have, really have an ace anymore. You could say, I don't, I don't think they have an ace on their staff. You know, they have a small payroll. They're going to need some players to step up again, like Randy Rosarena, where he kind of flashed in the playoffs last year. The Chicago White Sox are, are an interesting team because they're kind of like the Jays. they got a youth movement. they made a few signings to acquire veterans. They look like they want to try to push through this season and make a splash, but there aren't a lot of teams that really – should be afraid. The Dodgers are not afraid of anybody and they shouldn't be. They got a good manager in Dave Roberts. They got the best staff in baseball. They got the best outfield in baseball. It's they're Like I said, the rich can keep getting richer in baseball because of no salary cap and good on the Dodgers. I mean, until this is rectified, which I don't know if it will be teams like the Dodgers that make a lot of money will succeed. And I don't love it because I think the game kind of gets mundane and it can get a little boring where you have the Dodgers, the Yankees, you know, again, this is why I prefer the salary cap model because I think in the NHL, the Toronto Maple Leafs, New York Rangers would be spending a whole bunch of money and are they guaranteed to win? No, but I think it's way better odds. And I'm sure, you know, Leafs fans are probably yelling at me right through the screen right now saying, well, we want them to win. Well, you know, change your format to baseball and you'll have a better chance, but it's the dog. This is a huge move. Um, he's obviously from Southern California. So it makes sense for him to stay out there. Good weather. And you get to possibly win a world series and you have a big year and this is make 40 million bucks, win a world series, pitch great. Then opt out if you want. Crazy, crazy. Um, but yeah, Tre Trevor Bauer, a huge signing. He was really the last big piece. I mean, there's still some good players. I said, yeah, there Molina still at their James Paxton still available, but these aren't, these aren't franchise changers. And I think Bauer is, and it seems less right now because he went to you know, a Dodgers team, like I said, with already three Cy Young win or two Cy Young winners and a fringe one and Walker Bueller on the roster. So but, you know, the Dodgers are are locked and loaded and should be primed for another World Series run here uh, when, when uh, the season kicks off um, on April 1st. Also, over the weekend, uh, you know, some great NHL action. We saw Toronto Maple Leafs. You know, they've been playing dominant hockey lately. And 
and you, you can only play who's in front of you. And we mentioned that about the Ottawa games, but I, I put less into that. But, you know, Austin Matthews leads the NHL in goals right now at 10. He's scoring for really easily. I mean, it looks effortless for him right now. I mean, the Vancouver Canucks are pathetic. Pathetic. Just... Thursday night and Saturday night's games were, I don't even know how, they were so bad. It was laughable. They don't even try. Like, their effort is, I can't even say it's lackluster because that's doing them a favor. That's how bad it is. They, they just don't give an effort. I mean, Elias Pettersson, who I think a lot of people said he's going to be a great number one center. He hasn't even looked engaged this year. JT Miller, who played great last year, not playing good hockey. Quinn Hughes, who, again, I think he's being asked to do too much at a young age. He's kind of getting you know run over. And I think you got to look at Jim Benning. He let Markstrom walk. I understood it. I think it was wrong, but I understood it. Markstrom's 30 years old. He wanted $6 million a year, six years. That's 36. Signed a guy to his 36 as a goalie. It is a bit scary. I get that. And he hasn't exactly played fantastic for the Flames this year. So let's not throw a glass, you know, let's throw a stone at glass houses on that one. If you watch Calgary at all this year, you know Jacob Markstrom has not been sensational. But Demko and Holt, I mean, you know, Holtby on Saturday night, I don't know if he smoked about 20 joints for the game or what, because he couldn't stop anything. And, you know, my, our co-host, one of my co-hosts here on To The Point, Seamus Saxmini says, you know, should, uh, sh- I think, should the least trade for Holtby for Freddie straight up? And I text him back. I said, hell no, you watching this game? No. And, but the biggest blunder for me for Jim Benning is not re-signing Chris Tanev. And, you know, Chris Tanev is not going to get a lot of publicity because he's not an offensive defenseman. And that's who gets the publicity nowadays. And that, that's just the way it is. But he... He just does everything well. He stabilizes things for Quinn Hughes. He gets the puck out. He makes a good entry. He boxes out the front of the net. It's not pretty, but it's the grunt work that leads to wins. And Quinn felt comfortable with Chris Tanev back there. He doesn't right now with – sometimes he's playing with Chatfield, Edler, who has lost about three steps in an offseason. I mean, Thursday night, Edler – He's got Jason Spezza in front of him. He gives him about 15 feet to step in and shoot. Why the hell are you giving Jason Spezza that much room? Jason Spezza is not, he's 37. He's not fast. Okay. He's not a fast skater anymore. He's got, he's like a snail with arthritis, with arthritis. He's not, he doesn't have it. If you give him 15 feet to walk in, he can still shoot. It's not fucking Connor McDavid gap up on him. I mean, come on. It's the simple stuff. And just like I said, the effort, Pedersen's effort, not there. Miller's not there. Another guy I I have to talk about. I mean, this is Jake Vertanen is one of the main reasons they let Chris Tanev walk. Jim Benning admitted to this. They wanted to keep Jake Vertanen. Jake Vertanen might be the laziest person in the the NHL. Vancouver plays Toronto night. Well, if he's dressed, which he shouldn't be, but he probably will be. Watch how little effort this guy gives. He's big. He should be a great player. He should be a power forward. He could be a Josh Anderson if he gave a fuck, but he doesn't. Play Zach McEwen, who's a gay. He's a a Atlanta Canada boy. But guess what? He cares. He fights for his teammates. He scores goals. He'll drop the mitts if you throw a cheap hit. For Tannen, we'll do his little drive-by, skate around, play 10 minutes, and you won't even know he was there. You think he's fucking golfing while he's playing hockey. Pathetic. You sign him for two and a half million bucks and you let Chris Tanev walk. That's a fireable offense for me. Jake for Tannen's the reason. So you go to just think you walk in your ownership's office, you know, the Aquilinis are up there. You guys are having your little champagne, whatever. So what's going on with Tanev? How, how are the negotiations going? Well, um, yeah, uh, we want to keep Tanev at two and a half. Oh, Oh, okay. What 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 about what about uh for Tannen? 
Uh, well, yeah, we want for we want for Tannen. Yeah, we, we're gonna let Tannen have walk. We'll keep for Tannen. No. Oh. Okay. Like what? What? Tanev played his whole career in Vancouver. I don't think he wanted to leave. But he wanted to be rewarded for what he's given them. And you reward Jake for Tannen for doing what? Being the most inconsistent player in the NHL? I mean, I don't get it. It's just stupidity from Jim Benning. I mean, that's just what it is. I mean, let's call a spade a spade. It's like putting lipstick on a pig. I mean, it's just... Just you can you can be mad if you lose a game three two and you give an, a good effort. You can say, well, at least we're playing good hockey. You know, they got us tonight. Austin Matthews went off. But when you don't even give an effort, that's when Travis Green must be pulling his hair out saying, What the hell is going on here? I don't know what JT Miller with Pedersen with these guys, I don't know what it is, but they played a lot of hockey, but they don't deserve the you don't get to say, oh, well, you played this many games. No, because every team's going to do it. And they I've said this a huge week for them. They go into Montreal to get their ass kicked twice. You want to try to get your ass kicked twice again. It's, it's, it's just, it's not there. It's not there for them. And, you know, the Maple Leafs are... You got to give the Maple Leafs credit. I mean, they're a point ahead of Montreal right now. Um, I still think Montreal is a better team than them, but Toronto's played great hockey to start the year. Austin Matthews looks fantastic. Um, playing, scoring goals at will. Mitch Marner uh, has played great with him. Uh, you know, they finally got Zach Hyman back on that line. That should never be broken up. I don't care if Thornton comes back and they like Joe because he's their daddy. Hyman goes and gets them the puck. He's invaluable to them. Marner doesn't go in the corner to get the puck. If you watch the game, if you watch hockey, you know it. He's not the guy to do it. Matthews doesn't enjoy doing it because for whatever reason, he's a big center, but he doesn't like to use his body physically. That's fine. You got Zach Hyman who's going to do the grunt work for you. Joe is not that guy anymore. Hyman needs to stay on that line. If you're Sheldon Keefe and you the guys come to you and say, well, we want Joe, you got to... Th- Show some backbone and say, yeah, that's not happening. No. Hyman staying. Um, and, but for the least, Wayne Simmons was playing some great hockey, and I feel terrible for him. He's out six weeks with a hand injury. I don't know if he broke his hand or not, but tough break for him, scoring five goals, playing some really good hockey, and he's had some injury problems in the past. I, I feel bad for him. Um, this definitely hurts the, the, the Leafs depth. I mean, they playing the likes of Travis Boyd and Engvall and, uh, you know, some of these guys that really, you know, jo- Joey Anderson, not playing guys who aren't NHL players, uh, it hurts them. And it shows their lack of depth at the AHL level where they don't have, you know, really adequate replacements for, for injured players. You know, Rick, Nick Robertson, Joe Thornton have been skating, so they should be back soon. But, you know, I've, too bad for Wayne Simmons. He's been a good soldier for them. He fought uh, Jordy Ben Thursday night. He's been scoring, scored two goals on Saturday before his injury. So I hope he can come back healthy because I, I, I root for Wayne Simmons and I think he's a just a good guy in the game. Um, but I for Toronto, they got Vancouver tonight. But the big the big thing this week is they got Montreal twice, and those are the games that'll be must watch for me because they played opening night and they're both different teams since then. I think Montreal has showed the ability to play a team game to get contributions from every line. You know, Jeff Petrie defenseman's got six goals on the year. Josh, Josh Anderson, my boy, has got eight goals. Uh, Jake Allen has been fantastic for them in a backup role. He started already three or four games. They got a team there. Toronto, what can you get from your bottom six? Because the top guys are going to bring it, but they're not on every shift. When you throw out VC, when you throw out Engvall and these bottom line players, how, how, can, you, how can you deal with it? And how, how are you going to match up against these really good players? And that, that's kind of the big, 
big question for me is how, how can you shape up against these teams? So th th that'll be th their, their defense and their bottom six forwards against Montreal's defense and bottom six forwards where you got the likes of, you know, Jake Evans is a guy who doesn't get talked about, but he brings a lot to the table. You know, I, I think you look at our Terry Lekkinen, Tyler Toffoli has been bouncing around between a second, third line role to Foley, they, they can, it'll be, uh, it'd just be interesting to see what, what can happen in these two games, but uh, an interesting, interesting start for sure. And, uh, but another thing in the NHL that I, I wanted to bring up today is officiating. I think officiating has been, I'll just be honest, fucking terrible to start this year. The calls that, I don't know if you, if you watch the game Saturday, Edmonton, Calgary, but McDavid was going in on a rush. He basically gets hacked down. And he hits into Markstrom. They call goalie interference. It was not goalie interference. And then they call another penalty that game. Joachim Nordstrom gets a call for tripping, which is like a phantom trip. It was a joke. And Jeff Warb's laughing. They score in the power play. The officiating is getting too much. It's like fucking offside review. I hate it. And these stupid ticky-tack calls, are they ruin the flow of the game. I watched the Montreal Ottawa game Saturday afternoon. There was 10 power plays combined for the two teams. I mean, come on. I mean, there was a play where Ben Chirot was just battling in front with Colin White. They called him for cross checking. It was a battle. You can still do that, NHL. They should encourage that. So there's less drive bys and stupid little entries. But the NHL's got to talk to their officiating, they're calling everything. There's still got to be some subjective things in the game where you're just like, well, that was just a, a hard nosed play. And it pisses me off when there's that many calls. Cause I like to see just a free flowing game and there's less and less of that now. And it's, it's tough. It's I, I just let them play. Sometimes it's got to happen. And, you know, Saturday night, the first Matthews goal, it, what was that? I mean, that, that, that wasn't a penalty. Are you kidding me? And then he scores on the power, which is great. It's not his fault. He's, you capitalize on it. But come on. Come on. Come on, officiating. You can do better than this. I know you aren't good at your job, but you can do better than this. Um, talk about, yes, you know, the, the East Division. And I, I mentioned this before the season when I did the podcast with Seamus, that it's the toughest division in hockey. That hasn't changed. The Canadian division has not rocked that one bit for me. Uh, that opinion will never change for me. But, you know, just going to rattle off a few, you know, a few numbers here. Boston, 8-1-2 and two start. Pretty quiet. I know the Canadian, uh, Canadian division has been eating up a lot of the media headlines, and, you know, Toronto has been getting a lot of pub. Boston's 8-1-2, and two, and that's just, a, just for reference. Uh, yeah, they're playing pretty good hockey. David Pasternak's back. Uh, you know, he's a superstar. I mean, he's unbelievable. Uh, Marchand's playing really, you know, Bergeron. The team team uh, looks pretty good. Also with 18 points, 8-3 and 2 start, the Philadelphia Flyers. You know, yesterday they played Washington in a big game. They come up with a victory after, you know, being down several times, coming up with a big third period. Sean Couturier with a, with a big game for him. You know, Joel Farabee's can, been contributing and, you know, I mean, Ovi was super Ovi yesterday with two beautiful snipes. And he obviously put, you know, New Brunswick's own Philip Myers on a poster when he undressed him, uh, which was not even fair. And then that pass to Tom Wilson. Oh. But Ovechkin can't pass, right? Right, Crosby fans? He can't pass. He doesn't pass the puck. I don't know. Uh, pretty, pretty good pass. Him and Tom Wilson both with four points yesterday. And, you know, they lost the game, but dominating performance from, from those two men. Um, but... And you got Washington six three and three with fifteen points. They've had their COVID issues, and this division, you know, is having their own COVID problems right now. But New Jersey currently not playing, Buffalo not playing, uh, but you know, it's it's a logjam. You got Pittsburgh with eleven points. You got New Jersey, the Islanders, the Rangers, and Buffalo all with ten points. It's going to be a dogfight in this division because I think the first three are clearly better than the rest. I think Pittsburgh can get close to that group. Um, but you know you can't rule out the Islanders to get a big win um, Saturday night against Pittsburgh, scoring a late goal by Captain Anders Lee. Jordan Eberle scored two in the game, so the Islanders are 
snapped a five-game losing streak. Maybe they can find their game a bit here. I, I predicted them not to make the playoffs before the season, but they still have that hardworking team. If they can get some good goaltending, then you know we'll see what they can bring. The Rangers are another team that's interesting just because they're young, but they have some talent. You know, Pittsburgh, they're kind of in a state of flux. They're looking to hire a GM right now. It sounds like it might be Ron Hextall, who's the former GM of Pitch, uh, Philadelphia, obviously. So that would be an interesting hire. Buffalo, yeah, Eichel, you know, they've got their whole crew of players there. So, but there's a lot of COVID going through. So some of these teams won't be playing until the end of the week if everything goes well. But um, we'll, we'll see what, what happens with, with the division. But I just think you look at the top of it, the three teams, Boston, Philly, Washington, are all elite. Uh, and I, I, you know, in this podcast, I'm going to do my best to point out great teams. You know, Vegas hadn't played in over a week. And then they play LA Friday night. I mean, they hadn't played in a week. So you think maybe they'll come out a bit rusty. No, they scored four goals in the, in the first period. I mean, it was, they're damn good. Um, but we're seeing some COVID stuff go down with the States, with, with these teams. Hopefully they can sort it out, work it out. Minnesota is currently on hiatus. St. Louis, uh, like I said, Buffalo, New Jersey. It's you know, Colorado. So it's it's a mess right now. But um, hopefully we can battle through this. Uh, I, I like the the Philly, Washington, boss. Those games are all, all been great. And obviously uh, a huge congrats to – uh, Philip Maye, formerly of uh, the University of New Brunswick, and uh, p- playing for Victoriaville, made his NHL debut yesterday at age 28. Uh, had to battle his way to get there, so so good for him. Uh, and you know, uh, also good for Pierre Olivier Joseph, who uh, obviously played for the Charlottetown Islanders. His brother uh, won a Stanley Cup last year with with the Tampa Bay Lightning. He scored his first NHL goal on Saturday night against the Islanders. So. Good for Pierre Olivier Joseph. Uh, he's had a great since getting the opportunity. He's, he's played really good hockey, and uh, credit to him and keep up the good work. Um, a couple more things before we wrap up today. Uh, I mentioned before the NBA All Star Game. Uh, yeah, it. You know, this might anger some people, but you know, it's my podcast. So, for me, to me, real sports fans don't like All Star Games. Um, if you clamor for an all-star game, I, I, I gotta sit down and talk with you. I really do because I don't get you. I don't, I don't understand you. The all-star game is everything that sports sports isn't sports is about competitiveness. Sports is about battling for the win, doing what you can to win. All-star games is about flipping pucks to each other and, you know, giving a wave to a little Freddie who's out in the stands and nobody can. Little kids that go to all-star games, I don't even think they like it. Why would you? There's no intensity. There's no skating heart. It's just goalies not trying. People not trying to get hurt. The players hate it. Ovechkin, Crosby, skip it every year. And the NBA, the NBA, you know, it's a, it's a pandemic. They've had COVID problems all year. They're trying to get through this season, right? And what they did is they scheduled half – they schedule the first half of the season, all their games. And then they give the players a five day break just to decompress. They had a short off season. I'm fine with that. I think that's smart. And, but, you know, during this time, they said, why, why not have a, an all-star game? Let's bring all of our elite players in the game to one arena. Hmm. So you bring them all to Atlanta. They're flying on different charters, come from different places. And let's just say Anthony Davis tests positive for COVID. And he's in this with, you know, Trey Young, with LeBron, with Kawhi Leonard, with Paul George, with Kyle Lowry, all great players. What if they all get it? Then they're all out two weeks. And who's going to play? Am I going to dress for the Charlotte Hornets in two weeks? The league, imagine half of these guys tested pause, it would fucking break the league because even if players didn't, if they were in close contact, they have to sit out for 10 days. So that means that 10 day span, they can't play. So you're dressing backups 
And there's going to be national TV games where Joe from Nebraska tunes in and he goes, who the hell is Trey Mann from the Clippers? Who is this guy? I'm flipping something else. It would be such a PR disaster. And I get the TV partners like ESPN, TNT want this, but it's so stupid. LeBron came out and said, I hate it. I've had to come back earlier. I'm 37 years old. I came back. And now there's an all-star game during the pandemic. All-star game should be canceled from the get-go. Get the players a break. Fans want a weekend off where you don't have sports. All that sh- three-point shooting contests and the NHL when you got the fastest skater and all. If you want it for the NHL, if they want to, if they honestly want to do something, have a weekend where the women, the great women and the you know PWHL and NCAA, they showcase, but they have a game. It's not an all-star game where you get Canada Canada versus USA women's hockey. An actual game that counts, not some joke where you bring out Kendall Coin Schofield just to do a, a foot race, which I don't think even was positive because she sits there for, for the skills competition. They can play. Have All-Star Weekend with the NHL sponsoring it, so you're promoting the women's game, where you get Canada versus USA women's hockey. Not fucking McDavid throwing a little saucer pass from 80 feet because nobody gives a shit to try to stop it to dry side when it goes in. I don't need to watch that. That stupid three-on-three tournament. The NBA, same thing. Three-point shooting contest, whatever. Dunk, the dunk contest has been dead forever. Since Vince Carter won it, I haven't really seen an intriguing one. Blake Griffin jumping over the whatever. I don't care. I'm not watching it. But to say that they're doing this, if I was a if I was a star player and LeBron came out and said he he's not for it, he'd go if it was voted in. If I was LeBron James, I would take a stand and say, guess what? I'm not going. If I'm voted, I'm not going. He'll he'll get fined, but he would send a message to the other teams and to the players' association that guess what? I'm not down with this. And if LeBron does it, I think you'll see more and more. I think there's more and more players that who want to do who wants to do that this year, go to an all-star game. Because it's not like the players are going to be able to go out and drink and have a good time after they're done. Because we've seen what happened with the Capitals. They have a couple drinks with teammates after a game in a hotel room and they get their app, you know, they get slapped on the wrist. It's it's just such a stupid idea. Get through the season. Try to stay as healthy as you can. Don't overthink this. And they are with a stupid, stupid all-star game. And, you know, we talk about cancel culture. Cancel the fucking all-star game. Cancel the shootout. All this stupid gimmick stuff that have nothing to do with sports. The shootout's got nothing to do with the game. This all-star game, do something. Do something to promote another sport. Like I said, the women's hockey game. Have that weekend be the women... Have Canada, USA play two, three times. Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday, Canada versus USA, the women. That would be way more intriguing to me. You get a new audience. You put it on national TV. You know, put my sister on Team Canada. I'll watch it. Shout out Canada. Tally Warren. Put her on the team. Um, But, you know, even if she was, it's just... It's a new audience. It promotes the game. It gets people interested in the women's game and it'll help it grow the sport. You're not growing the sport on an all-star weekend in the NBA or or NHL right now. Because if if people tune in just for the all-star game to start to like hockey or basketball, I I would, if I, that was the first time I ever saw it, I'd say, I'm never watching this fucking shit again. This sucks. Let's just be smart. This year, no all-star game, but every other year, Let's get the women's hockey going and play actual games, not some foot race where it's just like, okay, she's here, you know, for a lap. Let's, let's do it right. Let's promote, let's promote the women's game. Let's get that going. How's, how's that for an idea? Not some gimmick where you get four, you get all the guys who like fantasy that like this stupid all-star game. No, no. I'm, fuck the all-star game. Um, Starting last night and, Obviously, it's been a while, but, you know, tennis is back. The Australian Open, uh, you know, last year it was played in January, right before the shutdown. They had all fans there and felt like a different time. 
Um, but you know, the players went through the rigor to get here. They had to quarantine for multiple times. Some players quarantine for more than 20 days because of a positive test, but the tournament's going to go on. You know, a lot of Canadians in, in, in action last night, Bianca and played her first match in over a calendar year winning in, in uh, three sets. So good sign for her. Milos Raonic cruised to a win. Marino got a win. Denis Shapovalov's actually on still playing right now. He's in a fifth set against Yannick Sinner of Italy. Uh, Felix Oje Aliassim won in straight sets last night. So a lot of Canadian content, you know, Serena Williams also, you know, in the field, Novak Djokovic, uh, Roger Federer still out recovering from a knee injury, but you know, you get a tennis grand slam. It's good stuff. It's obviously tough to watch with it's starting about eight o'clock every night and it runs till about 8 a.m. So obviously the time change hurts the, the viewing uh, of this tournament, but um, it's always, a, I always like the event and, you know, I'll, I'll be watching and we'll talk about it here, here in the podcast as the tournament rolls on. But uh, I think it'd be interesting to see what Bianca can do. She obviously wins her first match, but how's her fitness going to be? her stamina can she go through a whole tournament you know i think she's a she's a woman that people in canada have a lot of high hopes for for being you know elite talent and you know a grand slam winner multiple times over uh, this will be a big test for her early in her career to come back from from an injury and see what she can do uh in the biggest stage here but yeah we'll, we'll be talking about that but uh like i said it was, it was this weekend was about the super bowl a great game the NFL season is over, which is sad, but uh, like I said, I'll be talking about all the major moves when we get to the draft. We'll be breaking that down here. So the NFL is not going away. It never does. It always, uh, it always has headlines. So, um, and also, you know, congratulations to uh, just some of the names, Peyton Manning, Calvin Johnson, uh, John Lynch, Charles Woodson for being inducted into the pro football hall of fame. Um, and also, Congratulations to Alex Smith winning comeback player of the year, Saturday night at the NFL honors. And um, nobody deserved that more than him. Um, you know, Aaron Rodgers winning the MVP, uh, Aaron Donald winning defensive player of the year, uh, Justin Herbert winning offensive rookie of the year, Chase Young winning defensive rookie of the year. Uh, Russell Wilson w- winning uh, Walter Payton man of the year for his, for his work off the field when it comes to charity work, when it, you know, in the community, so shout out to him for you know just being a good guy. Him and his wife, uh, I think it's C- it's either Sienna or Sierra. She's a singer, uh, and uh, they both, you know, they both do great things. Off and all, I think they've pledged over four million dollars already uh, this year to to more uh, off the field projects. So good for Russell. Good on Russell Wilson and um, you know, every guy who's nominated for that award does, deserves a ton of credit and respect for what for what they do in their community. But you know, that's going to do it for today's show. Like I said, a lot more coming here into the point. Um, the NBA is in full swing. Uh, pitchers and catchers are going to be reporting to baseball. Uh, NHL is still going. So a lot of stuff to talk about. I'll be back tomorrow night with Seamus. Uh, we'll be talking about the NBA, actually. Your honor is going to be – it wasn't on last night so because of the Super Bowl, so we'll talk about that next week. But tomorrow night we'll talk about some NBA topics. Uh, just to shake things up a bit, go through the season so far and, and what we uh, have and haven't seen. But um, everybody have a great day. Hope you enjoyed the Super Bowl. Stay safe and we'll talk soon.